So Paul, we need something really small and really hot. And that's great because we have something in our inventory out in space called a neutron star that just perfectly fits this bill. But would a neutron star be this hot? Well, so a neutron star, we remember, is formed when a massive star, 10, 20 times the mass of our sun, runs out of nuclear fuel in its center and collapses down, and it forms a neutron star. And the center of that star is literally billions of degrees when the neutron star is born. So the neutron star is going to be born really, really hot. So it sounds like a really good hypothesis here that these things, these X-ray sources, are neutron stars left behind by supernovae. And further evidence for this came from the second one of these X-ray sources discovered. If you take an optical picture of the part of the sky where it came from, the X-rays, this is what you see. Ah. It's a picture we've seen before. Yes, this is the Crab Nebula. This is where, in 1054, the Chinese saw a guest star that is a, what we would now call a supernova, and we can literally see the interior of that big star that exploded a thousand years ago expanding. And so here we have something hot and small. Seems to me like uh, it's sort of game over. We have our explanation. It's a neutron star. Yes, this would be a very short lesson if that was the case, but things get a little bit more complicated, as so often the case in astronomy. One problem. This is the second X-ray source discovered, and sure enough, this sits right in the middle of a supernova remnant. But how about the first one, the one that's called Scorpius X1, because it's in the constellation of Scorpius, an incredibly bright X-ray source. Do you know any supernovae recently in Scorpius? Uh, no, I don't, and we've got a pretty good record of them as well. We certainly didn't see anything explode, and there's not doesn't sound like there's even any supernova remnant in that part of the sky. So that would indicate that if it was produced by a supernova, the supernova must have been quite a long time ago, long yeah. enough that we have no records and that the blast wave has faded out of visibility. But that's, how long does it take a blast wave to fade to invisibility? It's quite oh, a long time. it's about a, a couple hundred thousand years is before a supernova fades, but a hundred thousand, you're right, a hundred thousand years is a long time. Because, of course, that neutron star that's really hot and really small puts out a lot of energy, and it's going to cool and not so be so hot and not so bright. Yep, so that's one puzzle. Um, but not all these X-ray sources, in fact, the majority of the X-ray sources aren't associated with nice uh, supernova remnants like this. And there's also another problem. If you... If it was the pulsar in the middle that was producing the X-rays, then you'd expect an X-ray image just to show a little dot in the middle. All the radiation would be coming just from that neutron star smaller than the pixel in the center. So when they took their picture, did they see a little dot in the center? What did they see? Well, to begin with, they couldn't quite tell the it was coming vaguely from somewhere around here. But they used a very cunning trick. They waited until the moon went across this part of the sky. And as the edge of the moon went across, it will block out X-rays. And if everything was coming from a little dot in the middle, you'd see full X-rays, full X-rays, and suddenly when the limb of the moon crosses it, it, it'll drop to nothing right away. Okay. But they did the measurement. It was a really hard one to do because the sounding rockets are very unreliable, hard to launch them at exactly the right time. You had to get precise to the time when the moon is crossing exactly the right place. But they managed it. And what they found is instead of having an abrupt drop in X-rays at the moment when the limb of the moon crossed the middle, they had a more gentle drop in brightness of X-rays. So it didn't suddenly go away, it went over more gradually, about, take, about the time it takes the moon to cross a fair, part, port, a fair portion of this. So that's interesting because, you know, we can get a sense of how this would work if you've ever seen a total solar eclipse. The sun is really, really bright, and then when that final bit of the sun gets covered up, it just instantly turns black. And what you're saying is that was a slow process, and that seems to indicate that what it was ever glowing in the X-rays had to be actually, the X-rays themselves uh, had to not be really, really small on the sky, but actually quite broad. So that seems a little different than that idea of all the X-rays coming from the neutron star. And if you get a modern X-ray image of this part of the sky, you can indeed see this is where the X-rays come from, and they're not all coming from a dot in the middle, they're actually mostly coming from the sort of whirlpooly shape around things. Okay, so we have it's something that still makes me happy there in the center, but most of the X-rays are coming from outside in this sort of windy bit and stuff, so I could imagine there's lots of shocks and things, but those only last for thousands of years, so you get X-rays a little bit, but then there's got to be a source of energy that keeps things going, yes. even from those shocks. We need something to get the nebula and excite it. And curiously enough, about the same time that these observations are being made, a, th a theorist called Franco Pacini came up with a possible explanation. The idea was that, of course, that when a star has magnetic fields, 
and the star presumably that formed the neutron star had magnetic fields and it could be that when it collapsed to form the neutron star it dragged its magnetic field lines in with it and so what was originally a fairly spread out magnetic field became an incredibly concentrated magnetic field. So really powerful magnet. Yeah, I mean, a good analogy of this is rubber bands. Let's imagine this whole room was full of rubber bands running from the roof to the floor, and I get an arm full of them, and then pull them tight, and then go around in circles like this. I'm going to get this really tangled knot of rubber bands that will probably fling me back round again at the end. Uh, and the same thing might happen in this case. You've got the star, neutron star, which is presumably, because of conservation of angular momentum, is going to be spinning really fast by the time it's formed. So that's sort of like the analogy of the of the person doing the, uh, the, the figure skating. skating and bringing their arms in and speeding up. I always do it with phone books and a chair. It's quite fun when you're bored at the office. Take the phones in and spin yourself around in your chair. So you have a really strong magnetic field rotating like crazy. In fact, to do the calculations, the amount of energy you get in just one cubic meter of that magnetic field would be enough to only power the entire world. Wow, okay. And it's spinning really fast. I mean, that means it's constantly changing. And whenever you get a magnetic field that changes, it generates an electric field, which generates a magnetic field, and you've got electromagnetic rays. Uh -huh. In this case, there'd be very low frequency radio waves with a frequency of only maybe one hertz, yep. which means a, a wavelength of uh, 300,000 kilometers. Right. So this is far too long wavelength for anything we can pick up. And in fact, it wouldn't get out of the nebula. But the idea is these incredibly low frequency radio waves with enormous energy would come out and they'd get mopped up by the electrons in the nebula and excite them and give them lots of energy, which would produce shocks and x-rays and everything we see. So you're, what you're going to really do is you're going to transfer the energy of that 1.4 solar mass rotating neutron star and you're going to transfer that energy. And there's a lot of energy. That's like the world's biggest flywheel. And through this process, you're going to transfer that energy out into the nebula, and then you can get shocks or something to give you the x-rays. Yeah, it sounds like it almost might work. Okay.